studios of KPFK Pacifica Radio in Los Angeles. This is Uprising and I'm Sonali Kohatkar. It's Friday, August 28, 2015. Former Symbionese Liberation Army member James Kilgore joins us. He's now a professor and he's written a new book called Understanding Mass Incarceration, a People's Guide to the Key Civil Rights Struggle of Our Time. And we'll explore the sordid history of U.S. national parks. It involves the displacement of Native American tribes. Plus, Ugandan activist Bukenya Musa joins us in studio to share his model of grassroots empowerment and human rights work. That's coming up after the news. Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Christina Mislan. She's an assistant professor of journalism studies at the Missouri School of Journalism. Hi, Christina. Hello, Sonali. An abandoned truck found on a European highway filled with the bodies of migrants has once more brought the crisis of migration to the fore. 71 bodies were found, likely of Syrian origin, inside a truck on a highway between Hungary and Austria. Among the dead were 60 men, 8 women and 3 very young children. They likely suffocated in the locked truck. A Bulgarian man connected with the truck has been arrested. The horrific news came on the same day as many, that as many as 200 people died in the Mediterranean Sea when a boat sank off of the coast of Libya. About 400 people had boarded that boat. Some 3,000 migrants were rescued by Swedish ship and Italian coast guardsmen separately. Well, Christina, war-torn Middle Eastern and African nations seem to be just hemorrhaging people. Do you think that this migrant crisis could force Europe to examine in both its foreign policies and immigration policies? Well, we know that European countries have been saying for quite a while now that they're going to re-examine their policies. And that, that was months ago. We've been dealing, um, well, Europe has been dealing with this, although the United States has its own immigration issues as well. But Europe has, dealing with, has been dealing with this for this past year. Um, the issue of migrants dying overseas then um, has um, been occurring for way too long now. And um, as one of their solutions, they put in place an operation that really served kind of like as a taxi service where Border Patrol agents would pick up refugees being carried by smugglers on boats. But that doesn't obviously seem to be stopping the number of people who are dying um, trying to get to Europe. So there obviously must be more. And some policy experts are suggesting that Europe should maybe look to U.S. for some ideas. But as I just mentioned, I'm not sure that's the best idea as we're dealing with our own anti-immigration policies. And we're also part of the problem as well, U.S. foreign policy, that being the case. Um, but, you know, maybe implementing programs where refugees could actually attain asylum before leaving home, um, where Europe would actually be responsible um, for making sure that people could um, get to Europe safely. Here in the United States, the National Labor Relations Board, or NLRB, has just struck a major blow to the corporate fast food industry. Companies like McDonald's had long protected themselves against being held accountable for labor violations, saying that that was the responsibility of the franchise owners. But in a 3-2 to two decision, the NLRB ruled that workers could hold parent companies liable for violations. The ruling is extremely significant in that unions could now negotiate directly with a handful of major companies instead of having to contend with thousands of smaller franchise owners. It also means that franchise owners may not necessarily be responsible when carrying out directives from parent companies that impact its workers. Unions like SEIU and the Teamsters celebrated the ruling. Millions of American workers are employed by franchises. Uh, well, Christina, do you see this as a huge legal victory that unions could take serious advantage of? Yeah, there definitely is a huge advantage for uh, unions here. Now, maybe if we could take this advantage and apply it elsewhere, for instance, there are many other institutions where the notions of employment need to be redefined so that various types of workers could be protected. Now, remember, though, um, for a while now, I mean, unions are still illegal in some states. And if we look at some of the latest stats, approximately about 11.8% of American workers are actually union members. And in the private sector, that's just 69 So we still have a long way to go, but this is definitely, hopefully, a beginning to that. And finally, a major tropical storm has hit the Caribbean island of Dominica and is headed toward Florida. In Dominica, four people were killed when the storm caused major mudslides. Erica is now unfolding in Puerto Rico, where major rains are hitting the island hard. It could hit Florida over the weekend or by Monday as a hurricane. The National Weather Service and other forecasters are confused about the storm's direction when its center started wobbling yesterday, which made it hard to forecast. Florida Governor Rick Scott said the storm posed a, quote, severe threat to the entire state 
He's declared a state of emergency. This week marks the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, which devastated New Orleans, killing thousands and displacing hundreds of thousands. Well, Christina, Governor Rick Scott is a, a vehement climate change denier. He's even unofficially banned the use of the terms climate change and global warming in his presence. Do you see some major irony here? Well, I'm not sure if it's irony. I think it's just um, interest at stake. And so, for instance, um, and I'll relate this, we can maybe think about um, Louisiana's Governor Bobby Jindal and this 10-year anniversary on Katrina. Um, he recently just wrote a letter to President Obama before Obama went to New Orleans to speak to say that President Obama should not say or politicize anything about climate change, et cetera, in his speech. Now, here's the thing is that Bobby Jindal is funded by the energy companies. I mean, he has a plant right outside of his estate in Louisiana. The same thing goes for someone like Governor Rick Scott. Rick Scott has been funded politically by energy companies. So again, a lot of times when politicians are seen as these climate change deniers, I think we actually really need to start looking at really, is it that they're deniers or their interests are not our interests? Christina, thank you as always for joining us. We'll talk to you again next week. Thank you. Christina Mislan is our daily News Flash guest expert. She's an assistant professor of journalism studies at the Missouri School of Journalism. This is Uprising. And by the way, you can check out my latest column at truthdick.com, where I write about a lot of the stories that you hear on the air. This week, I wrote about Amazon, uh, Amazon.com's workplace problems. Again, that's at truthdick.com. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. The United States imprisons more people than anyone else in the world, hands down. Not only is it the absolute number of people we imprison greater than any other nation, but we also lead in the percentage of our population that we lock up. These are shameful facts behind which lie many complex factors. And exploring those factors in a new book is James Kilgore. Kilgore knows a thing or two about prisons. He spent several years behind bars for his radical political activism in the 1970s via his membership in the Symbionese Liberation Army, or SLA. The SLA, as you may recall, was involved in the famed kidnapping of heiress Patty Hearst in 1974. Here is how a CBS News article described Kilgore's story. Quote, the Oregon natives survived the 1974 shootout between the SLA and police in Los Angeles, in which six SLA members died. He disappeared in 1975. After more than 25 years on the run, U.S. federal marshals arrested Kilgore in South Africa, where he'd been living under an assumed name. He was extradited to the United States and later sentenced to six years in a prison. Well, James Kilgore is now an adjunct instructor of global studies and urban planning at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. His book is called Understanding Mass Incarceration, A People's Guide to the Key Civil Rights Struggle of Our Time. He now joins me live on the program. Welcome to Uprising. Uh, good morning, Sonali. Uh, nice to be with you. Thanks for joining us. Well, you have quite a story, but your book focuses on the nitty-gritty of incarceration. Did your personal experience on the inside influence your book and become a factor in its uniqueness? We have books about mass incarceration, but I'm not sure how many have been written by somebody who spent six years themselves behind bars. Absolutely. My prison experience shaped this book. During that six and a half years, I saw an endless stream of black, brown, and poor white bodies coming through those prison gates. And most of them were serving incredible sentences, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, life, life without parole, double life. I had one friend who was doing 555 years. And when I found out their stories, the crimes that they had been convicted of, I couldn't quite figure out how that connected to the level of punishment that they were receiving. So this prompted me when I was released from prison in 2009 to investigate this thing which I later found was called mass incarceration. 
and I became an activist in my own community around these issues, opposing a jail project in my county of Champaign County, Illinois. But also I began to research and write because I'd been a researcher and, ed and an educator, a popular educator before I was incarcerated. And I thought that there was a need for a book that described mass incarceration broadly from Obama to Clinton to Reagan, from the war on immigrants to the war on drugs, but did it in an accessible way using the voices of people who were directly impacted. So that's how I set out to uh, undertake this project of writing a book about which I've called the key civil rights struggle of our era. And in fact, on that specific phrase that you use, uh, how much of that has to do with the fact that this system that we have in the United States impacts the poor and specifically people of color most so? Does that fact highlight that not only is this a system that's insidious in how many people it, it brings into its dragnet, but that it targets vulnerable ones. Absolutely. As we, as many people know through the writings of Michelle Alexander and others, the African American population in prisons and jails is about 40%, more than double their rate in the general population. In the state where I live in Illinois, African Americans make up 15% of the general population, 58% of those in prison. But I think it's also important to recognize that mass incarceration is not simply about locking people up, but that, that it's an approach to how we deal with poverty, how we deal with poor people's problems. Instead of providing welfare support, social services, instead of allocating resources into those communities, we've chosen to punish poverty, to punish the poor, with the direct result that a, a disproportionate amount of the prison population is people of color, and the communities that they come from have been devastated by the loss of those people to prisons and jails, and also by the policing activities that have been gone, that have been taking place there, largely as a result of the war on drugs, and more recently, wars on immigrants. And I want to get to those two wars in particular, and how casting them as wars is crucial. The prison population, however, didn't sort of balloon in a vacuum. It grew, it wasn't just politicians who've pushed this, right? It's, it's grown with the permission of at least some sectors of U.S. society. Absolutely, but I think there's been a concerted effort to create a public mindset to generate a fear of crime, a fear of the criminals, and the media has played a big role in this. If you look at the, for example, if you look at the increased coverage of crime stories on local news from the 1970s to the 1990s, we know now that if it bleeds, it leads. And almost every night, if you look at that local news, you're going to see a crime story, sometimes quite a minor story, leading rather than much more important events that are taking place elsewhere. And then we had the creation of these kind of media figures who became emblematic of the criminal. We had the case of Willie Horton in 1988, who was released from prison on a furlough program and then committed some crimes on that furlough some violent crimes while on furlough, but he had been released by Michael Dukakis, who was the governor of Massachusetts at the time, who was campaigning for president. And George Bush used the image of Willie Horton against Michael Dukakis in a successful uh, run to, to gain the presidency. Similar, on the female side, we had the creation of the welfare queen by, welfare queen by Ronald Reagan, uh, casting African-American women in particular as those who were living off welfare checks in multiple identities, driving Cadillacs, living in five-story mansions, et cetera, et cetera, all off the taxpayer dollar. And this was calculated to raise the ire of, in particular, socially conservative white voters who were upset at the fact that somehow their tax dollars were being misused. Uh, by by these kinds of people. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the powerful statements you make uh, about how racism permits mass incarceration is, quote, blacks are the repository for the American fear of crime. I thought that was a really uh, eloquent and, and very powerful statement. Can you expand on that a little bit? I mean, you, you just did it to an extent, but also when, when, we, when it comes to interactions between police and African-Americans, that statement in particular becomes crucial. 
Well, certainly we've seen the reactions of police to African Americans in the recent cases in Sam, Sandra Bland, Sam DuBose, and so forth, where we had very vivid video coverage of what are really everyday kinds of events that the ones that we've seen are the ones that have gone horribly wrong, but on a day-to-day -day basis, we're seeing these kinds of en encounters where there's an assumption when a person is driving while black that they're up to that they're up to no good and that they're subject to search to all kinds of unreasonable requests and in many cases physical abuse even to the point of death and if we look at the stop and frisk policies in new york if we look at cases studies of racial profiling of traffic stops in in Minneapolis, and even in the town where I live, in Urbana, Illinois, we find that there's a disproportionate number of African-American drivers who are pulled over, even though the evidence shows they're less likely to be uh, to have contraband in their cars than similarly profiled white drivers. How serious a role has money played in the expansion of the prison industrial complex? Uh, imprisonment is supposed to be a government affair, um, but today many prisons and detention centers are run by for-profit corporations, which means that the more people we imprison, the more money these companies make, and that is just a perversion. Absolutely. I think I like to describe the prison industrial complex as a public-private partnership. And I think in some circles there's a tendency to blame all of this, for example, on the private prison operators, but really private prisons only control about 9% of the prison beds in the United States. So they, in some senses, are a minor player. Hmm. And there's much, uh, there's a much broader range of corporate interests that kind of get off the hook in terms of making the uh, profits from this system. So we have construction companies, we have even major finance houses like Goldman Sachs have been involved in underwriting the bonds that were used to build a whole ray, array of, of prisons in California in, in the 1990s. And then we have the service providers in prison, companies like Securus Technologies that made $114 million last year off of, off of prison phone calls. We have Aramark Food Corporation. We have Corizon Health Services. All of these are feeding at the trough of, of the uh, budgets of mass incarceration. And it's a, it's a big economic project, but underlying it is, this, is a political project about how we solve problems of poverty, homelessness, mental health, substance abuse, et cetera. And that's the, where the public sector comes in and where the change in the state from a state that focused on providing at least some semblance of a social safety net to a state whose main task seems to be providing profit opportunities for private corporations and pushing security. And of course, at the heart of all of these stories is the fact that there are living, breathing fellow Americans, human beings, uh, in some cases immigrants, Live, you know, existing behind bars. And one thing that sets your books uh, apart from this, uh, on this subject is that occasionally uh, you include poetry, you have even a section on music from the prison system. And uh, I like this poem that you put in your book by a lifer named Joseph Dole. I just want to read for my audience a couple of paragraphs, uh, stanzas of this. It's called American Supermax. A guard informed me upon arrival that there are benefits to this isolation. He promoted the fact that we are now all safe from gang retaliation. I had to ask her, but what of the retaliation of the prison administration? He smiled cryptically as he enjoyed this in ecstatic contemplation. There's uh, several more stanzas, but I, I, I thought that was really uh, powerful. Why did you include this? Well, I think it's really important in terms of building a social movement to resist, to overturn, to destroy mass incarceration, that people who have been incarcerated, who are incarcerated, and their families and communities are playing a leading role in this, and we hear their voices. We, we have a, lots of academic studies, and these are very important, but we need to also include the voices of those who have been locked up. They have a different perspective, and as well as their, as well as their families, their children, their partners, and so forth. And there's kind of a stereotype that people have about people who are incarcerated. Somehow they think that when we're in prison, we sit in our cell all day depressed 
kind of looking out a window at a gray wall or something. But prisons have their own ways of developing activities, of developing forms of resistance. And even if we're not at all times seeing people do, doing heroic actions, doing hunger strikes, doing other kinds of activities, on a day-to-day -day basis, people find ways to resist the authority of the administration, to resist the dehumanization of being incarcerated. And one of the ways people do this is by writing. So that's why I've included the, the works of, of Joseph Dole, for example, because he's written, written many, many uh, poems, but he's also written an entire book doing a life sentence in the Illinois state prison system. He's written an entire book about about mass incarceration in the prison system. So these are these are critical voices. And I think organizations like All of Us Are None, organizations like A New Way of Life in Los Angeles have have played a big role in bringing out those voices. Now, uh, one, uh, I want to go back to what we, what you brought up earlier, which is that uh, there are many aspects to why uh, people get fed into the prison system. The war on drugs is one that we talk about a lot. There's also the war on immigrants, which has become a sort of a new feeder into the prison system. Um, it's been around for a long time, but it's been expanded quite a bit. Why do you, does putting these issues into the context of war make sense? Well, because I think we're we're attacking these problems as if we're fighting a, a foreign enemy. I mean, we're 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 attacking them with border patrols. We're attacking them with 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 security walls. We could call those high security fences. The same kinds of things that we that we put that we put around prisons. Uh, so the 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 major thrust of this has been a law enforcement thrust around dealing with immigration. And I think it's important to recognize that while I've talked about how the private prisons don't control a huge sector of the of the prison and jail system they do play a very important role in immigration immigration has become the cash cow for corporations like the corrections corporations of america and the geo group the major players who are hold about 40 percent of the immigration detention cells and are constantly hiring lobbyists and so forth to press for harsher immigration laws in order to expand their market base. So this is a particular area where immigrants' rights activists have focused on these private prisons because they can see that this is one of the areas where they've really succeeded in carving out a market niche and, and growing it. And since 2010, uh, sorry, since the year 2000, we've seen in particular that the percentage of people locked up who are Latino has grown dramatically. And you have a whole section in your book on women called the gendered threads of punishment, focusing on the women whose loved ones are in prison, but then on women prisoners themselves. But something like 90% of all people in prison in the U.S. are men. Why is it important to look at the gendered side of this? Well, although 90% of the people in prison may be men, they leave behind families, largely led by women, mothers, grandmothers, sisters, partners and so forth, children, and and these families have to cope with the difficulty of having an incarcerated loved one. First of all, in many cases, it's a it removes a major source of financial support. There's the emotional and the parenting duties that, that those left behind need to carry out in a situation where the kinds of social services and welfare benefits are, are, are being reduced. And then there's also the extra burden of just supporting someone directly when they're incarcerated. Prison phone calls have become hugely expensive. There's campaigns against that now. But when I was in prison, I was paying a dollar a minute for a phone call. Mm -hmm. Some places they pay, even, they pay even more than that. Most of our prisons in many states are sited in remote rural areas, which are, are a long journey from the urban areas where the majority of people who are incarcerated live. So visiting becomes a major expense. All of these kinds of things add up to a tremendous collateral consequence of mass incarceration that's often neglected largely, I believe, because of a gender bias right. that we don't really see these issues in a complex way 
that in, including a, a gender lens. Finally, James, the whole premise of prisons is supposed to be rehabilitation, and clearly we've come very, very far away from that. Are you in your book discussing the concepts of restorative justice, taking your cue from a lot of local organizations around the country that have begun to try to change the conversation on prisons. Can you uh, end with giving us some ideas uh, that you lay out in your book on how the prison system needs to desperately be reformed? Well, there's there's the reform within the prison to re-inject some kind of ethos of rehabilitation in the prison. But I don't think that should be our major focus. Our major focus needs to be on measures that keep people from going to prison and then get more people out of prison. So changing the approach, changing the mindset is key. We need to get away from this notion that we have to punish people and punish people to the extreme for harm done or wrongs they may have committed. Restorative justice takes a step in that direction by, by getting people to look toward solutions that don't involve incarceration, that in, may involve dialogue between people, say in the case of, a, of an assault or uh, or the case of a household robbery, the idea of restorative justice is to get the people who are involved in that together to talk about why it happened and see if some kind of compensation might be able to be paid rather than having someone be incarcerated. But I think more important is the notion of transformative justice, which says that not only do we need to do those restorative practices, but we need to dig deeper and find out what is the cause of why we're locking people up and transform that system, because it's the system that's locking people up. It's the system of, of laws, the system of policing, and the social welfare system that's operating under a punitive basis that needs to be transformed in order to stop that flow of bodies into the, into the prisons. James, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Best of luck to you with your book. Thank you very much, Sonali. It's been a pleasure talking to you. My guest is James Kilgore. He is an adjunct instructor of global studies and urban planning at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And we've been discussing his book, Understanding Mass Incarceration, a people's guide to the key civil rights struggle of our time. He spent six years in prison himself because of his role in the Symbionese Liberation Army. You can look up his story online. James Kilgore is his name, K-I-L-G-O-R-E. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. An organization known as Survival International has launched a campaign criticizing conservation efforts in the U.S. and abroad. On the surface, this sounds extremely regressive. But the campaign, dubbed Stop, Stop the Con, makes the case that conservation efforts like national parks and nature reserves are often built on the violent displacement of indigenous communities that called those spaces their homes. Take Yosemite, for example. In 1851, California soldiers came across the land that is now a famed tourist destination and kicked out the Awanichi tribe. The displacement that wrapped up as recently as 1969 erased the history of indigenous people in that region and whitewashed the idea of conservation. Writing about the campaign in the Huffington Post the week that the National Park Service turned 99 years old is my guest, Julian Brave Noisecat. He is the Native Issues Fellow at the Huffington Post and a member of the Kanim Lake Band to question in uh, British Columbia, where he was nominated to run for chief in 2014. He recently wrote the piece, The Forgotten History of Violent Displacement, that helped create the national parks. Welcome to Uprising, Julian. Thanks so much for having me. And I'm so sorry I mispronounced that word. Can you say it for me on the air so everyone can hear? Uh, it's sick as can. Thank you very much. Okay, so how did the Stop the Con campaign begin? A woman named Tessia Bobricki carried out a major stunt at Yosemite and videotaped herself doing it. What is her motivation? 
So the Stop the Con campaign began two weeks ago when, as you said, Tasia Bobricki, an environmental activist from California, scaled El Capitan in Yosemite National Park and dangled from a rope 3,000 feet above the valley floor. Um, you can watch a video of the stunt in my article, and the clip can also be found on YouTube. Um, her motivation was to expose uh, the quote-unquote con of conservation, that is the violent displacement of indigenous peoples in the name of conservation. Hmm. And often we think of development as displacing indigenous peoples, not conservation. You brought up in your article, and I briefly mentioned it, the history of a park like Yosemite, which is the site of Tessia's um, uh, PR stunt to launch this campaign. Do most national parks in the U.S. have a similar history as Yosemite? Well, it is really the history of the U.S. no matter where you are. Right. Um, in order for the United States to be founded, indigenous peoples everywhere had to be killed and displaced. Um, but to specifically address your question, yes, many national parks have this history. Yellowstone, um, another park, for example, was under the care of the U.S. Army from 1886 to 1918 in order to keep out indigenous peoples and poor settlers who lived in the area. And uh, staying on Yosemite for a little bit, I, I very briefly mentioned the tribe that was kicked out. But uh, initially, of course, they were pushed out, but then they returned to take on roles that were essentially servicing people who visited the park, uh, mostly white Americans at that time. And uh, can you go a little bit deeper into that history? Yeah, so in Yosemite, the Awanichi Indians, um, as they were called, and as they called themselves, um, worked for years, um, all the way until actually 1969, to give a sense for how recent this history really is, um, as, as performers sort of performing fun in sort of a really messed up way. Um, they actually had to perform as Plains Indians because that's the idea about what Indians were supposed to be that tourists had. They had to and perform, so they, meaning per perform for people who were there? Yeah, so they did dances and they did sort of um, uh, like Wild West show type type wow. things. Uh, and they did that so that they could, could keep living in the park, which had always been their homeland. Uh, and they were finally evicted in 1969, and their their homes unceremoniously burned down in a in a firefighting drill by the Park Service. Hmm. Now there have been um, historians that have um, uncovered this history, and I want to get to that. But most of the history that we read in our school books, um, and even you know the pamphlets that we get when we visit these parks, don't really tell the story well enough or at all. Um, the story, for example, of John Muir is very sanitized, um, and, and we hear this romantic story of how his conservationist ideals helped uh, preserve spaces like Yosemite. Um, and so, you know, do you see that there's been a concerted effort to, to not really face this history? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you mentioned pamphlets and, and school textbooks, but even recently, Ken Burns uh, celebrated documentary on the national parks, which called them America's best idea, completely ignored this history, um, even though the scholarship was out there. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of the historians that you write uh, about. Uh, you mentioned several in your article, William Cronin, Mark Spence, Carl Jacobi. How has their, uh, what, how have they dug into this history and how has it been received? Have they broken into the mainstream or have they sort of uh, ruffled feathers? So unfortunately, I would say that we live in a time when public spaces like the national parks are under attack by the political right. Um, and this history doesn't fit well into the moral fables that, um, you know, sort of go along partisan lines. And so environmental circles who feel under attack haven't been very receptive to these historians' work. I think that's really too bad um, because looking at the history allows us to see ways in which public management of spaces like the national parks, which are undoubtedly beautiful and need to be preserved, um, could be improved. Uh, now, uh, it is, is, it, is it a Western notion, Julian, for us to look at conservation of nature as these uninhabited spaces that we preserve outside of our living spaces and separate from them? Do we need to, is this history telling us that we need to look, change the way we approach conservation, um, you know, from the ground up and the ties that indigenous communities have to the land they occupy and that they've lived on for centuries? Yeah, so I think 
conservation is absolutely a Western notion, but I think calling it a Western notion isn't specific enough. As um, Carl Jacobi points out in his outstanding book, Crimes Against Nature, conservation is specifically an upper class idea that comes from the late 19th and early 20th century elite on the East Coast. Um, people like John Muir, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, etc., people who write these sort of travel logs and have the kind of money to do that thing. Um, and conservation did target indigenous people's removal, but it also targeted the rural poor, so it meant keeping out um, all the people who, who had been living in these parks. Now, uh, you mentioned earlier the history of the United States is the history of national parks. So let's talk a little bit more about that. The, the U.S. national parks history does fit within the broader um, history of colonization of the U.S., the genocide of Native Americans. And yet we you know, don't really think about that when we visit national parks, for example, when we celebrate, which you know, certainly we should be happy that there are spaces that haven't been developed by uh, corpors, corporations or, uh, you know, completely allowed to languish by the right wing. But um, th how important is it for us to set the history of national parks within the broader history of U.S. colonization? So far from taking place, I think, in the deep past on some faraway frontier or on rural Indian reservations that are hidden from the public eye and that we never hear about, I think that the history of, of colonization and settlement is is everywhere and it's inescapable and I think that that's really the point that I I was I was trying to drive home subtly with um, this this sort of history about this piece about the national parks uh, because you know everybody takes road trips to these places um, you know everybody has their their memories of them but what people don't realize often is that um, this was all Indian land it was a place where indigenous peoples buried their ancestors worshipped their creator and lived for for millennia. Do we see the process of conservation as it had played out in the U.S. playing out elsewhere in the world today where indigenous communities are driven out in order to preserve spaces for tourists, etc. and you know it's okay for tigers or lions to inhabit them but not people? Yeah, so I mean <laughs> like everything American, uh, the model of conservation that, that uh, Survival International is critiquing and that these uh, scholars have studied has been exported elsewhere um, and according to Survival International, places like Cameroon, Botswana and India are currently practicing this uh, conservation as displacing the indigenous peoples model. So what is con uh, Survival International's um, goal with their Stop the Con campaign? Do they, are they trying to change the minds of conservationists? How, you know, w what would be the way to approach these issues? So Survival International wants to start a public debate, so, uh, you know, hopefully having me on the show today uh, helps continue that conversation. Um, and I think that what, what they kind of want to, to strive for primarily is the inclusion of indigenous peoples as stewards and managers of um, these public spaces. Mm -hmm. I think that that's their primary aim, but they want to start by 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 starting this conversation. And uh, we will post a link to their website, survivalinternational.org, later today on our website, as well as a link to your article, Julian, at uprisingwithsonali.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. My guest is Julian Brave Noise Cat, and he is a uh, native, the Native Issues Fellow at the Huffington Post. He is also the author of a new article called The Forgotten History of Violent Displacement that Helped Create the National Parks. This week, U.S. National Park Service turned 99 years old. This is Uprising. We'll be right back after this break. Mm -hmm.
Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. Uganda is a relatively small landlocked country in East Africa bordering Kenya, South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. For decades, the country has been ruled formally by President Yoweri Museveni, informally by the terror of the Lord's Resistance Army or LRA. Some years ago, a U.S. government-backed campaign to capture Joseph Kony, the leader of the LRA, captivated Americans. Now that the focus on Kony has waned, little about Uganda makes the news. Although the war formally ended in 2006, the LRA persists. But ordinary people in northern Uganda from where the LRA emerged are taking matters into their own hands. My guest, Bukenya Musa, is the founder and director of an organization in northern Uganda called Volunteer Action Network. Ina joins me in studio. Welcome to Uprising, Bukenya. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Now, let's talk about, uh, I want to discuss the, the politics of Uganda before we get to the work that you do. Just to set the stage for our audience, I mentioned um, the Lord's Resistance Army and gave a brief overview, but how active is the LRA right now? Uh, LRA right now is not um, uh, act very active in the region, like in northern Uganda. It's, it's pushed away to Central Africa, actually. So northern Uganda region now is um, is in a state of rebuilding, you know, instead of uh, trying to get back into their homes, leaving the internet displaced camps. And yeah, it's relatively safe. Um, like you, you can't hear blades on the streets, but people. Um, are not yet settled in, inside them. They still think um, Connie at one point of time will come back and, you know, and destabilize them. Hmm. Yeah. So there's still a fear that the LRA fear. will return because there hasn't been a yeah. sort of a formal um, end to, I mean, there were supposed to be two, uh, peace talks in 2006. Some people yeah. still treat 2006 as the formal end of that war, but uh, it's not really fully ended and there's still a fear. Yeah, exactly. It's still a lot of fear, and that is exhibited from, you see, people fear to go and stay in their villages. They much more prefer to uh, be in, like, in the town centers, thinking something can happen at any time. What yeah. about the governor, government and the presidency of Yoweri Museveni? He is seen as a major figure in the African Union. Uh, the U.S. Uh, relies on him, but he has ruled well past his term. How, is, how have his policies impacted ordinary people in Uganda? Uh, the policies are very, very appealing, actually, and I think it's the general problem, like um, leaders um, overstaying in power. You know, you know. Personally, I'm, I'm just uh, clocking, going to be clocking uh, 30 years in <laughs> in a few months. Uh, in a few months, like in November, he'll have completed 30 uh, years as yeah, president. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've never seen any other president, so uh, wow. the only president that he's I've the known. only president you've ever known. E exactly, and. And so with that, it has corrupted all the systems in, in place and it's not helping the local population. And so local populations don't have um, much of a reliance on, on the government. Actually, it is so deeply entrenched that like, uh, politics is full of tokenism right now. It, it has made, tokenism? Yeah, people, it has made people to be so impoverished. And, and um, he just rigs his way out by use of state resources and... He always gets um, re-erected back, but <laughs> well, uh, recently he signed uh, and his government signed an agreement with Kenya to build an oil pipeline through Kenya's north, um, and this was months in the works. Uh, and often this has been a major problem in uh, impoverished African nations, where natural resources are what companies, outside companies, come in to take advantage of. And they can do that because of corrupt leaders. Yeah, yeah actually, that is happening a lot. There is a lot of growing wave of seeing that East Africa, the whole East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda have like a common market, have the East African common market. And all that is um, is about just, you know, tapping into the new ray, you know, uh, resources, which is oil in Uganda. That is to benefit like the politicians. Yes. The people, there is no much education around it, what is going to happen. There's a lot of land conflicts, you know, like the government is just grabbing the land and giving it away, giving deals to uh, multinational companies. Uh, there is no compensations of um, the people who have been inhabiting on those lands and and all that. So and there's a lot of little uh, infrastructure development in terms of lands that are heading to those area rich areas. And and of course, the, you know, those kind of development are, are targeted just to shift on with the oils. Um, like, for example, it would be 
pretty very good if uh, we're going to have a refinery in Uganda to create like you know employment it would uh, to have you know lessen the, the the cost of oil but but the the refinery which is going to be pushed away from Uganda to Kenya is to ship the crude oil to Mombasa and then it will be shipped away and in return we'll get it back at a much high higher rate. And a much higher rate which will not you know mm. you know help yeah. yeah. So let's talk about what ordinary people have been doing in Uganda um, because, of course, there's uh, little reliance on the government uh, and there's still fear from groups like the LRA. Um, tell me about your work, but also specifically tell me about the fact that you, you, the work you've done has been focused on women and women's rights. Yeah. How, has, how did you get to where you are at in terms of seeing women's empowerment and women's work as important? Yeah, actually, um, you know, if you could go in statistics of Uganda, you know, you find like almost 49% um, um, uh, live in chronic poverty, you know, but if you could get the percentage of the 49, like almost 60% of them are women. And uh, the cultural um, beliefs in Uganda, the government, you know, policies doesn't favor women. You'll find that girl child education is very low. So Girls we'll find education? that yeah, yeah, so we find that few women have gone literacy into rates ed education. are very low. Yeah. They're very low. And uh, then uh, with that trickles in the way how they will um, you know, get into business. Get into business and the way how they will participate into your like planning planning processes or making decisions in the community. Yeah, worldwide, so, girls yeah. and women's education yeah. it seems to always correlate with their, how, you know, their rights, their ability to, to lift themselves up and their, their uh, autonomy. Yeah. And so often that's something that's talked about a lot, but yeah. not much is done. So how does your organization, Volunteer Action Network, how did you get involved in it and start it and aim it towards women? Yeah, I actually personally, you know, have um, you know, passionate about that because my mother, I died. I, I never had the mother laugh. You know, I lost her to almost six years when I was very young. You were six when she. Yeah, when she died, and she died in my presence. You know, and um, that it was just about domestic violence. You know, my stepdad coming and fighting every day, asking for food uh, when he's drunk, and then uh, on a fateful day, she kicked my mom badly, and my mom died. And uh, when I grew up after school, you know, I started asking questions. Why would my mom be beaten every day? And she can't question. She can't go away. She can't do everything. So I st then I started to see my mom never went to school. My mom, she's a housewife. You know, she never had any business activity that she's doing. And then I said, say, maybe if she had a little bit of education, she would, uh, you know, be a little she bit self-aware, yeah, and, a little bit more. yeah and might have been able to do something exactly, to and herself. and it, the most you know appalling things that that there was no um, uh, this um, gentleman was not held accountable for that, and and so because maybe she's not engaged into economic activities, you know, and so she was financially dependent, uh, dependent on, on, on which is of course the case. Exactly, this is a universal story of domestic exactly, violence. Exactly. So and the. And then that has to spark, you know, me to see that I do something, and and uh, that's how I said, okay, we need to figure out something that really can change this. And um, and I thought that having a model that combining um, microcredit um, education and uh, social programming can be, you know, can be, you know, a good fit to address the systematic inequalities you know, around women. And absolutely, these are not um, radical solutions. It's not mysterious how yeah. one goes about um, addressing the problems of society. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the micro credit, the micro loans, uh, which is now a popular model in many poor countries where w women are given small loans to s to learn a trade and start their own business. How has it? How is it implemented in northern Uganda, and how well has it worked? Yeah, um, actually, you know. Fortunately enough, like in our communities, we still have what we call community. It might not be existing very much in the Western context, but, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but people, are, people are so much depending on one another. Right. People trust one another. So, and uh, in the fact that people are so poor, so they don't have collaterals. 
you know, they don't have collaterals. You know, they don't have anything that will, they will take in the bank as security Collar to collateral. to get yeah, to get loans. So, uh, using social collateral, women coming together and guaranteeing themselves is one of ways how they can work together. So, so they are accountable to one another exactly. because they have deep community ties. E exactly. So, and and that is one way of how we you know penetrate in working with them hmm. using a group uh, methodology model where they can co-guarantee each other and then and making sure that it's not just about giving them money to start business but to train them on how to use that money and how to save it and how to reinvest that money so that they're yeah, so independent yes, they don't exactly. have to wear, rely on either exactly. the government or a foreign corporation coming in and handing out jobs and then taking them away yeah. or not paying them very well exactly and our big role is to support um self you know reliance actually you know, to have them, you know, have their own businesses and, you know, have uh, their own representation. It is very, very interesting that for the last eight years that we've been doing that, we have had women that have moved away from being just uh, a street vendor selling just tomatoes and then making restaurants. And then we have had a shift of five women joining uh, elective politics and they are representative at the district level. Wow, so they're not just so, uh, starting enterprises, exactly. they're entering politics. Yeah, exactly. When like their economic status goes up, they vie for that, and that creates like a whole spiral of like they're going to be um, representing views, and you know will have the so policies can trickle changed. up to exactly. democratic, real grassroots exactly. democracy. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Now uh, there there are so many challenges when poverty is rampant. Uh, there was a there's a major malaria epidemic in northern Uganda, which the Ministry of Health announced in July, you need public health infrastructure. You still need infrastructure from government. What are, how, how do you meet that challenge? Uh, actually, it is really very, very, um, very hard, you know, because we have the, uh, the government, the government per se tries as what it can, and it makes, it holds, you know, people captives. It's like, you know, because of the low levels of education, low level uh, of high level of literacy, people don't know their rights. That the that the government has a responsibility to provide. So the government there, when it provides that, it's like, you know, you must vote well. We've had our so they use it as a way exactly. to get political support. Exactly, we've mm -hmm. had our president so much when uh, you know women uh, when people stand up to, you know, to ask questions about infrastructure, about public health and all that issue says, okay, next time if you vote very well, hmm, things will be in there. Right now, we are seeing a lot of like infrastructure from like, kind of roads spouring and, and then they are just using it because uh, months to come, like six months in February, we'll be going into another election and they will say, we have made roads for you, so you need to keep us in power. Hmm. So, yeah. Now, uh, the openings that Americans and certain types of Americans see in Uganda um, are also problematic because there's st still such a dire need for services. Um, evangelical Christians from the United States have often found their way to Uganda and places like Uganda um, set up centers uh, where they feel like they're saving particularly children. What do you make of that? Uh, it's in, uh, you can be honest. Well, well, it, <laughs> on this front. yeah. Well, it is good that they come to save, but I think it's important to build self reliance and self determination in Africa. That thing has, for a long time, been eroded away, and that is the pride that most of African lost to, to have that. You know, uh, there's so much thinking on the dependency syndrome, you know, always thinking of a savior to come and, and you solve the, your own problem. And that whole thing uh, trickles into that. I think- So it trickles into that public consciousness. E exactly. I think it's always important to, um, to support Africans to solve their own problems. And it's important that all the programmings, that when they're coming up with the programmings, we have a bottom-up programming, but not to, not to bring a concept that 
per se would work in America and you think it would work to Africa. African or even guess, uh, even yeah. impose things in Africa exactly. that they wouldn't dare to impose exactly. in the United States, such as one of the things that uh, has come out of the Christian evangelical movement in Uganda has yeah. been the promotion of homophobic laws, <laughs> the so-called kill the gays bill <laughs> um, that uh, that has that alerted the, you know, the, Uganda is known for that, sadly, yeah. then. Yeah. Uh, the, the work that you've done. How can our audience support the work that you do? Um, I personally find this whole idea of financial solidarity uh, is a very important thing when particularly there are organizations that say we don't need your ideas but you know we'll take your money because uh, that way we can empower yeah. ourselves um, and make the decisions about how to use that money, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, I, I think, you, you know, like the model we're using requires very small amounts of money, like mm. a donation of $50 that could be maybe a lunch, lunch for somebody. $50, uh, between $50 and $100, we give out a loan to, wow. uh, to, to a woman, a businesswoman who is starting a business. And um, the idea, which is very, very important, like, is like, the, on average, the family in Uganda is having five to seven people, five people. Mm -hmm. So when you support this one woman, you've supported five, five. And that in, woman in could go and, and start her own business or could exactly, even join politics. Yeah, exactly. She can start up that business and then um, the proceeds go directly to their families. You know, they treat their children, they pay their school fees, you know. So it means that we're going to have an a better future. That and these are Ugandan-run yeah. programs, exactly. which is key. Exactly. <laughs> well, so. I want to thank you so much, Bukenya, for joining us today yeah. and sharing some uh, the, the uh, information about the work that you do and the model that you're using. Yeah. Best of luck to you. Yeah, thank you so much for thank hosting Thank you very me. much. And give out a website a for your organization. Yeah, um, our website is www.vacnet.org. V-A-C-N-E-T yeah. dot yeah. org. We'll post that to our website later yeah. today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. My guest, Bukenya Musa, is the founder and program director of uh, in northern Uganda of an organization called the Volunteer Action Network, vacnet.org. This is Uprising. Anna Buss is our assistant producer and technical director. Christian Beck is our production coordinator. Teddy Robinson is our audio engineer. Special thanks to Jonathan Alexander for technical assistance. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Uprising with Sonali. Our website is uprisingwithsonali.com. Our theme music is by Quetzal. I'm Sonali, co-host and executive producer of Uprising. I'll see you next time. Thank you.